Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the Conversations Programme. My name is Emily Villar, I manage this edition of the Conversations Programme here in Basel. And we are very lucky today to have a really stellar lineup on stage and uh, to have our wonderful moderator, Jane Morris, who is editor at large, the art newspaper and Culture Shock. I will hand over to Jane in a second to do proper introductions to our speakers. But just before that, I'd like to just um, um, kindly remind you to keep your masks on at all times. Um, there'll be a Q&A session towards the end of the talk if you could kindly also keep your mask on when one of our um, hosts uh, will hold the uh, microphone up for you to talk. Without any further ado, I shall now hand over to Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you um, all of you for turning up. It's lovely to see so many people here um, in real life. This talk has been organized in conjunction with Engadin Art Talks, um, they've actually been running a series of conversations about the museums of the future, I think starting earlier this year. Um, and so this is one of them, and there's going to be another one in the Serpentine in London, I think in October, and then during FIAC um, in Paris. But we're partly here because they've produced a book called Museum of the Future, Now What? which Chris has provided an introduction for. Um, but it seems to be a moment where a lot of people are discussing this whole idea of the future of museums and what now. Um, some of you may know Andras Santo, who often moderates here. He produced a book earlier this year called The Future of the Museum. And Art Forum have devoted its last two issues um, to the museum now. And I think they've got some on their stand outside. Mm -hmm. So it seems that like much of the rest of the world working in different sectors, we feel like it's time for a major rethink, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. These articles cover an enormous range of subjects, you know, restitution, decolonization, deaccessioning, technology. For the purpose of this talk, we've decided to focus on the issue of sustainability. So basically, in the wake of COVID and also longer term, the climate crisis, and also the issue of relevance particularly museums being relevant to a wider range of people and in the wake of Black Lives Matter. Now, we are aware that we're not a very diverse panel. Art Basel did try very hard to include a wider range of speakers. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you will know, it's been very difficult for a lot of people to travel. But I'm delighted to have the panel we have got. It is indeed a stellar panel. I'm going to introduce them one by one, and I'm just going to ask each of them as I introduce them, just to sum up briefly what the pandemic has meant to their museum you know, in this very difficult period. So sitting next to me is Maria Balshaw. She's been the director of the Tate Gallery since 2017. I think you're now the director of the National Museum Directors Conference as well, um, which is a, a, a sort of informal grouping of the National Museum Directors in the UK. I think it'd be fair to say, Maria, that your focus has been very much on diversifying the collection and the audience, and now very much looking at who works for the organization. Mm -hmm. um, but tell me, what's it been like for the Tate? I mean, I know it's been tough. Yeah, well, I know that I'm speaking for anybody that works in a museum or a gallery or um, in uh, any part of the art world. Um, the last 18 months has, without question, been the most um, challenging and tempestuous and uncertain and um, s sometimes intolerable time that I have ever experienced as a museum professional. To give you just a single um, figure, the four Tates in the year before the pandemic welcomed 8.2 million visitors. And um, in the pandemic 12 months, we welcomed 600,000. I mean, so we were really only open properly for two and a half months. Um, and that means we were not there for our public. For much of that time, the nearly 1,000 people that worked for Tate were working from their kitchens and their living rooms and their studies and their shared houses. Um, it's meant the most severe financial challenge that Tate has ever encountered, unimaginable. My finance committee, um, just before the pandemic, predicted that we might have some impact, perhaps a couple of million pounds of damage. And 
a year later, we had seen losses of 59 million pounds. So we have had to learn to do everything differently. And out of that, because as I just said to Chris, I am a committed optimist. And I think that has been the only way to be, to manage all of the um, challenge and change that we've had. Out of that, I think we have nevertheless learned some incredibly valuable things about who museums can be and should be for and how we ought to do our business. And we'll be coming to that later. So I'm glad that there is a sense that uh, some good things are coming out of what I think has been pretty grim. Chris, uh, Chris Durkorn, um, again, formerly at the Tate some years ago, uh, now president of the Réunion des Musées Nationaux and also the Grand Palais. Um, you look after the commercial operations for a very large group of France's national museums. But I think probably one of the things that's been really occupying you is this massive renovation of the Grand Palais, which is a 460 million euro project. Did that all just keep going as normal through the pandemic? Or yeah, what's the situation been for you? First of all, I mean, we are in charge of many museums in France, but not just only the commercial activities, because one of our exhibitions right now is an exhibition curated by Eric de Chassé in Marseille called Surrealism in the United States. And the reason I bring that example up is that we have been, strangely enough, being able to do many things during the pandemic which we were not able to do before, like much more careful research, much more selective about what do we want to show, which loans do we want to get. And to give you one example is last night, we announced in an international press conference together with the Louvre, we are staging 18 shows at the same time in 18 different French cities, small shows, about the Islamic heritage of France mm -hmm. through the centuries until today. We would never, never been able to do that before. We were on video conferences the whole time. So some of the things we always wanted to do, we were suddenly capable to do because we were slowing down. Because, you know, running a museum, running museums, and not just the Louvre and Versailles, but also the museums in the silicon uh, of the south of France, I call it the Silicon Valley of Culture, is, is quite a rat race. I mean, we have been racing after the public and so on. What does it mean for us? Lots of debt, but yeah. at the same time, thank you, government. I mean, the government came across with millions for the Louvre, Versailles, for the Réunion de Musée National. So a public museum, which is supported by the state, some of us, we can survive and we can now do things maybe different, yes, maybe better, maybe, we'll see. But when you say all these books are coming out about the future, we have been talking about this future all along. It's now only now that these ideas are taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and last thing I would like to say, I, I was for the first time this morning again at the Art Basel, and I told myself in a time machine, it was like I found myself in 2019 again, and for the first time, and I just said it to Maria, I felt like Lee, we, the museums, for the first time in many years, we were much further ahead than the art market. So. That's interesting. Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne Pfeffer, I think many of you will know her. She's the director of the MMK in Frankfurt. Um, she's very well known for her work with artists. She uh, curated the Golden Lion winning German pavilion of Anna Imhoff in 2017. Um, but the current, you, you've also been very interested in thinking about the future of the museum. You organized a major exhibition on this subject two or three years ago. And I think at the moment, you're, you're presenting a major exhibition called Crip Time, um, which is looking at the meaning of disability and in exclusion. So you're very interested in how artists are responding to the challenges that we're talking about. Yeah, I think first of all, when I started the museum in 2018, I, we were already slowing down because I thought it's needed like, to prepare. Like MMK is a huge museum, 4,000 square meters. So I, I decided only to do two shows a year to have them six months or a bit less on and to have enough time to prepare everything and to think everything. And I think this is something, as Chris also said, that it's really good that we have now more time to think because I think the whole acceleration always keeps us from thinking. And it's, I think, one aim of the system 
that we should stop thinking because there's no room, there's no space and there's no time. And I think this is something we should really claim to take that time. And crypt time is maybe a special term. It's, I think, not, uh, not so much related to COVID than it maybe thinks so, but it's a time which a human being who's vulnerable need to take uh, in order to organize everyday life. And I think we all live in crypt time in, in the time that um, time should be related to the human body and should be related to us and not to the capitalistic thinking. And uh, I think this is maybe something we could learn from the pandemic and also this idea that we don't live alone, that we're living in a society. And I think it's time to rethink and also to formulate new terms of rethinking society uh, as a whole, because I think we all lost also our internationally. I think we all were stuck, like living one and a half year only in Germany. It was quite tough, and I think that we all experience that in our different countries that we are used to have an exchange, which also helps us to reflect ourselves. So I'm also grateful that now we can speak again. Storm Janser van Rensburg is the senior curator and also head of cura curatorial affairs at the Zeitz Mocha. Zeitz opened in 2017. Again, some of you might have visited it in a magnificent sort of huge 30 million pound buildings by Thomas Heatherwick and a collection loaned by the collector Jochen Weitz, Zeitz. <laughs> um, but you don't have an endowment, you don't have government funding. So how's it been, Storm? I'm imagining it's been hard when most <laughs> of your income has gone. Thank you so much. And I want to echo what all the other three panelists have said, because similar and ditto. Um, but as you said, the museum opened in 2017. That's four years this month. So a young institution really at the beginning. And when our visionary director, Koyo Kuo, joined in May 2019, a little bit, you know, two and a half years ago, the museum was already in crisis. So we entered into a kind of unexpected, immediate, like all of you, the kind of shock of an adjustment of a closed museum, a museum without people. And I think for us, the hardest part was in that particular moment to navigate that. Um, we took it on with responsibility, um, the time that was given, in a way, um, a responsibility, like you have mentioned, Chris, also to to research, to reconsider, to think about it, slow down as well. But in that slowdown period, also kind of became much more responsive to what's around us. The kind of uh, a kind of a real embracing again of the community immediately around us, or the communities around us, ways of engaging with that, and also thinking about how our programs and programming reaches further to slow down the kind of exhibition production that's extremely expensive and has. Um, also kind of giving us, you know, kind of certain ways of thinking about that. We are on austerity measures for the last year and a half. It's impacted on us as staff, on our audiences. We are in a kind of complex context. Um, we are a private museum with, with um, public interests. So we also kind of take that constituency very seriously. Zeismoka also stands in for a continent, you know, desire for this place for contemporary art on the continent. Um, and that added responsibility is something that we have navigated and kind of think through quite carefully. And so embracing that um, to our best of our ability with a small team and then, of course, with the, the kind of funding that has disappeared overnight, you know, figures 90 percent of our audience has not returned yet. And so we also kind of understanding what that means. But at the same time, I also think we've been able to really think around what our audiences are and who they are. With specific initiatives by inviting artists into the museum itself to make work, to use the museum as a place of production and thinking, um, but also by opening the museum doors to the entire Cape Town and a project that we opened when we opened the museum in 2020, uh, 2020 October, inviting every Cape Townian who wants to bring a work of art into the museum to bring it. And so over 1,800 Cape Townians responded with an artwork. And it's just a testament, again, that museums should be a place that celebrates the kind of close relationship that we have with artworks and that that importance needs to be emphasized. Yeah, I mean, I think this issue of how, how you think museums will sustain themselves is kind of, say, we're very much where I think we're going with the first sort of part of this conversation, because I know everyone's context is different. 
but we have seen 10 or 20 years of very ambitious museum expansions around the world. We've seen people building magnificent new buildings. We've seen an enormous increase in people's activities. So, you know, it's a long time, I think, since anybody thought their job was to, you know, just collect and conserve and interpret and exhibit. Museums do many, many more activities. But the background to this is not for everybody, but by and large, shrinking government subsidy. There are countries where you possibly would be concerned about full government subsidy because it, with subsidy comes a certain degree of control, and some governments are more honourable about that than others. We've seen, before the pandemic, we saw lots and lots of problems with certain kinds of sponsorship, with certain kinds of private patrons, questions about partnerships with certain countries. Some people now feel, and certainly the UK feels, that ticket sales is a way of adding barriers. So, you know, we don't want to make all our money off selling tickets to the public. Mm -hmm. So with all this complexity around how you're, you make a living, how, how do you think the ideal museum of the future should be funded? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it's the obligation of the state. Um, let, me, let me go back to another book published by Ink3 Editions by the Engadin Art Talks, which was the one published two years ago, which is the future of private museums. If you read the interviews with the private collectors who are running private museums or have the ambition to create a private museum, the only question which they never, never could really respond to fully or whatever is when Christina Bechtler and her editors asked them, is there a future for your private museum? Funny, isn't it? I mean, nobody came up with, well, I'm doing this and it's great and it's ambitious and it's, it's, it's complex, but the, the question of the future was not there. We are obliged to invent constantly the future. And in the forward time writing in the last book for Bechtler, in three editions, I'm, I'm saying that instead of the word in innovative, I way prefer the future because long-term thinking means a contract with your government because you're a, public, you're a public museum. And I do believe that we can survive and do things better because we have that very contract. So I'm an mm -hmm. utter optimistic and I'm an utter believer in the state and I'm kind of lucky to be able to work for King Emmanuel Macron. Uh, so, I mean, he believes in that as well. So I'm lucky, okay? There are others well, that, that who are is, not that, that is, lucky. That is indeed very and, fortunate. Uh, the, Germans, <laughs> the Germans who are here, they will hear next Sunday that they have, instead of uh, Empress Monica Grütters, probably King, uh, whatever, uh, the, the King of Olaf Scholz. Uh, he might do things differently, but I believe in that. But What's incredibly important that we believe that there is a future and we have to rewrite and invent that future over and over again. And this is a very, very, very good time to do it. In terms of expansions, I do believe, and I've been working on many buildings, as you know, Maria, from Rotterdam to the brief for the Hauser Kunst in Munich, to working for Nixerota and Tate Modern 2, the extension, and now the renovation of the Grand Palais. Expansion of a museum is the last thing before you have checked out all other options. Slowing down, shrinking down, doing things differently, reorganization, rethinking government. If you have responded to all these questions and all these options, then you can decide about what an expansion is. In terms of our expansion or renovation of the Crown Palais, very simple because I want to respond to your question before. We have been, during this pandemic, reviewing and changing every single aspect of that 465 million project. The plans of 2013, we turned them in for scrap 
And thanks to the monitors and the visio conferences, we were able to redesign completely the museum based on the questions asked right now. Okay. Yeah. I'd quite like to hear what the others would like to say about this funding question. As you can imagine, um, I don't entirely believe in the state in the UK situation. <laughs> and I know you don't talk about the, the person that currently leads the UK government. Um, no, you um, have a queen. The, <laughs> the obligations um, of the state, for me, absolutely have to um, underpin the public museum. But I think if there is only government funding, the, um, the healthy sense of an organisation needing to um, uh, change itself and challenge yeah. itself to meet the needs of the public and find ever more creative ways of generating our own income. Um, I think without that, um, the institution can become very staid. Yeah. Um, and I worry about the, um, the obligations that um, a very large amount of state funding places on any public institution. The idea in the 21st century that you can maintain, maintain a long arm's length and so I'll happily take the government money, but no, I will not engage with the politics of the government, I think is just um, impossible or naive. What do you think, Suzanne? Because you, 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 you are very well funded, I think. You, I think you told me it was not, you're not very well funded in cash terms, I meant, but I think you're 90% state funded. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, I think generally, I think it's really important to be state funded, but it also depends, as everybody say, on the government. And I think we are, you know, like, um, I think a lot of parties um, like to influence more and more um, what you are buying or what you, you do the program or they like to frighten it. I think uh, throughout the history of Germany, we are a bit protected because um, of freedom of art. Still, people are afraid to touch that. Um, but I think we already saw the last years how fast system can change and uh, yeah, and it means to be a public museum also means that uh, yeah, dependent of the government, and if the government change and the idea change, that um, yeah, I think it's a huge task to 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 be as a museum also a, f a reflection of then and also always being trying as being part of. I think you're totally right. We are not independent at all, but only trying to reflect what's going on there and also make that public. Because yeah. we had like um, the AfD uh, was criticizing our program and saying what was the direction of MMK and they wanted to talk with me and I realized that I don't want to talk with them alone. I only do that in public and I only do it like in a, yeah, in a public forum. And um, yeah, I think it shows me how, how easy it is to, fri to be frightened and to um, the parties trying to get influence on what you're doing and then I think it's important to reflect that role too that you're also an opposite I think an institution running as for me <coughs> running an institution it's a wonderful base but I think institution itself it's always have to be fight against from the inside itself but it's a structure which is not interested in art it's not interesting in politics it's just interesting in in like a machine like going on itself and trying to have no yeah, trouble from the inside or the outside. I just quite like to hear Storm's perspective because I imagine you'd quite like some public funding. Uh, indeed. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, the, the kind of challenges has been real. Um, and kind of the, you know, when, when you survive, you know, there's a lot of energy that goes into the act of survival. And I think we're also trying to think about what that productive, productiveness of that is. Um, it's real, you know, um, but it's also been a combination of, you know, kind of additional generosity from the founders of the museum, kind of searching for other philanthropic, you know, support. Also, at the same time, we're also developing new philanthropists in our context. Um, Philanthropy is tricky, though, isn't it? We all saw what happened with the Whitney, you know, and the terrible, situ well, the, the, the situation they've been in where... Uh, there's been, you know, huge protests because of where their where their patrons make their money. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I just sorry, there's two things I want to quickly mention. The first one is that um, the future disappeared at the beginning of the pandemic, 
the future that we imagined and that we kind of thought was going to happen. I don't think the future is necessarily right now the most productive place. I think it's potentially in the, the making of the now, the responsiveness in a kind of an action. Mm -hmm. I think we also should move the kind of like thinking and projections and what we want to be. Uh, it, I, th I think there's other urgencies right now. Um, and the th second thing, museums don't really change unless there's a pandemic or there's people picketing outside of your institution. So let's also be real about the kind of changes that are made and how they are made and when they are made. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. I think there have been challenges um, for us over the last 18 months that have speeded up mm -hmm. thinking about how we are operating in the present. So um, in my head at the moment is that last night in the UK, the Museum of the Year Award took place um, and an organisation, a, a museum called First Sight, which is in a smallish town called Colchester, won. Part of what they did to redefine themselves as a museum during the pandemic was to start to feed the children in the town who were not getting um, free school meals during the summer holidays, were not getting their free school meals because of the pandemic. And that, that had become, for the UK, almost one of the biggest societal causes championed by the football player, Marcus Rashford. But I was actually really proud that it was also tackled and championed by a gallery that asked itself the question, what is useful for our context now? And it was to engage local families by feeding the children and sharing the art with them. Mm -hmm. And something completely different has come out of that useful encounter with art. We've all talked about things like this for decades, yep. but actually there's been an acceleration of a deeper engagement um, and a sense of allowing the museum to become something new for the people who want to use it. But that's a very good illustration, what you were saying, Maria, about what Storm is saying, that just thinking about the future is not productive. I think what you want to say is you have to think the future in the present. Totally. And that is exactly what you're doing. But, my dear colleagues, we have also to bear now the consequences of our questions and actions and our objections. Because uh, from my own experience, it's uh, much more difficult to find the right sponsor. Because to a sponsor, there might always be you know, some problem attached. Well, in fact, it? that's been one of the difficulties, uh, isn't it? That so the most problematic we, we now have to bear the also the consequences about who are we going to elect as our board members, because uh, to some board members, we might also have certain questions. So it becomes more and more difficult. And I was confronted with that last night when our uh, development people brought up this amazing sponsor uh, creating cars. Mm. And that was not going uh, to be accepted by uh, our museums, suddenly. So, you know, we have, to, we have to think also about the consequences of these kind of actions and questions we have been asking ourselves uh, in and before and around the museum the past two years. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's useful not to be only looking at the future, but to really learn from the past. Because that challenge is as old as the collecting mm. of art itself. You know, when you look back at the 500 plus years in Tate Britain's collection, I can tell you most of the early works were either of slightly horrible people or given by slightly horrible people. Most of the great commissioning of art down the centuries has come from the powerful. What we're encountering right now is a much more disputed and lively conversation around the ethics of running the public museum. and. That means we'll be criticised much more, but I think I'm okay with that. Or that the state has to say, okay, then I will come up with more money. Yeah. and that is But it is a discussion that we yeah, should be having, absolutely, yeah. because you can't pretend that somehow the museum is separate from the world. Yeah, and that probably leads on to, I mean, obviously some of the biggest protests around sponsorship have all been around fossil fuels, although I'm interested that a, a, a museum was sponsored in the UK by an arms manufacturer, Raytheon, and it received very little comment. But anyway, BP, Shell, those big uh, fossil fuel companies have been a real touch point, but we all know why. It's because the climate crisis, it's not in the future now, it's, it's here. Um, Activist groups like XR 
would like to see net zero by 2025. I think we know that's going to be very difficult to do. But most governments are saying they want net zero by 2030 to 2050. And I wondered how you're all thinking about that, because I think there was probably a time when perhaps all of us thought it's not really entirely our problem, but now we know it is our problem. Mm. So, Maria, I think this has been a big issue for you. I'm happy to start, but I want to hear from the rest of the world as well. Um, I mean, it's been an issue, it, and it should have been an issue for the sector for the past two decades. I was involved in expanding and commissioning a new part of a building which was making the Whitworth in Manchester a third bigger, but reducing its carbon footprint by 10%. And that was... Did, did everyone hear Maria through that announcement? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So that was nearly 10 years ago. Um, Tate Modern 2 was um, um, developed according to um, um, passive principles that would uh, move towards managing the environment in ways that are not so energy intensive. My experience has been that we all should be doing this and that until really the last two years, many parts of the sector weren't doing it mm. or were still pretending it's not really my problem. And, you know, I'm with XR. I would like net zero by 2025. We should all, if we do not strive for that, whether or not we can get there or not, we will not start to make the changes that are necessary. But the pandemic has helped. So we have virtually, like you, virtually installed exhibitions um, in other parts of the world. We are moving things slower. We are thinking about a green plan for the sharing of our collection. We are challenging other lenders when they say that they will only lend if narrow international museum standards. I want to say, that's not a standard. That's something that we actually should be ashamed of because it requires energy. What's, what's the biggest, what's the biggest um, cause of carbon emissions for the Tate? Probably for everyone, well, actually. Well, it must be the same for everyone. It's actually the visitors coming. Right, but you, can't, <laughs> you don't want to stop them, do you, or do you? <laughs> no, no, but I mean, there are other challenges mm -hmm. coming up. And we are talking about, uh, in French, it's called sobriété numérique. In normal language, it's called digital sobriety, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, the digital is, is also something we really have to look very carefully at because all these things moving in the digital way is going to be absolutely becoming expensive. And yeah. at some and point we have to impact. pay it back. I mean, think about this, this NFT hysteria. I mean, yeah. the NFT thing is consuming so much energy and uh, we do not want to talk about it yet. Do we know, like Hito Steyerler just said, that NFT is just an alibi, you know, to start talking about crypto infrastructure? But, and but, where but, that taking place, this blockchain But the French in museums are not mincing NFTs. I accept no, no, there are no, people no, in the market I mean, who are at it. I, let, uh, I mean, digital sobriety is absolutely, uh, is absolutely crucial. And it's something we have to think about it as well. And I mean, Storm, these issues must be so pressing Absolutely. for you as a new museum. I mean, and likewise, I mean, we, we in a, a, an upcycled building, um, we're in a heritage building that was, you know, the concrete that was used back in the building came from what was excavated mm -hmm. from it. Um, we also, you know, and kind of a, a water, seawater cooling system. So, um, and in that regard, you know, kind of the precinct that we are has been very careful about the kind of, you know, developments and. Um, how that comes up, and I think similarly to you, you know, kind of our visitors would be a significant aspect. But those visitors has practically disappeared, um, and we kind of don't necessarily see that that's going to return back. But doesn't answer your question about how we address that. Mm -hmm. um, but we've certainly had found other ways of connecting with an audience that are invested in the work that we are doing. Um, but yeah, it's kind of real issues for us. Um, we've also, you know, used the time in the last year and a half to also think more about sustainable exhibitions. Exhibitions are dirty business, sorry. Yeah, because yeah. shipping, shipping the works around um, the world is From shipping is to the kind next of big build one. outs and, you know. Um, and so there's not necessarily concrete solutions, right? Sorry, excuse the pun. Um, solutions for this, but I think we we are uh, deeply invested in kind of shifting the, the, mm. the kind of work that we're doing and how we're doing it. That's why I think we are no light years ahead than the art market because I couldn't hear my, I couldn't believe my ears this morning when a very famous gallery dealer said to me, I'm looking for a space in Paris, but I want a space in an area of Paris where my clients can still come with their driver and their car. 
And I said, wow, you should call uh, Anne Hidalgo yeah. because this is not going to happen, my friend. But I'm I mean, a big shout out to the galleries, many of whom are here, who have been working on the galleries climate coalition. Yeah. So many parts of our kind of whole museum ecology are thinking about this. But to answer your question about do I want um, uh, to stop visitors? Of course, I don't want to stop visitors to a museum um, because we are for the public benefit. But the idea that you can define the best museum by the most people coming, yeah. I do want to challenge that. Because having the most of anything isn't necessarily the best. And so deepening our engagement in London with our local audiences, people who walk or use public transport, of course we welcome tourists that come back to London, but I hope many of them are on the Eurostar. Yeah, and yeah. that flying becomes rarer. But I'm very interested in what you were saying about the slow museum, because you've been going for long duration exhibitions, haven't you, Suzanne? I think your exhibitions can even run for six months. And that's obviously reduces the amount of work you ship massively. Mm. Yeah, and I also I think it gives the opportunity for visitors to come back. You know, I think a well-conceived show you can never really experience in one view. And I think it's nice to also to have time and to come back and yeah, and I also have more time to working on it. And I think what there was one a beauty in, in the closing down of the museum where that we I think all realized that uh, art has to be conceived in a space. And it's I think we all learn more about like digital program and other things. But I think the the reasons why we are spaces, why museum exists, I think for me became so obvious. And also um, there was was a sort of activism of, OK, now we go digital. And I, I was also a bit reluctant because I say, no, you know, I don't want to. It's so expensive running a museum. It's so much cheaper to close them all down and get digital. But I think, <laughs> I think we all need this space. And the space also realizing I did a lot of studio visits in the last year on Zoom. And it was better than not meeting any artists, but it's the whole conversation was so flat and never really deep. And I think it's, mm. there is something really, in, really meeting and really encounter art, and um, which is not replaced by any digital form. I think we all learned a lot which parts or which conference or which parts. And also to enable remote control, there are a lot of people who can't enter other spaces or who can't travel. We had a lot of audience for our for our program, which came not from Frankfurt, but from all over Germany, which was nice that people could attend even mm -hmm. without being there. And I think this is something we want to keep, because there are also people who, who are ill and can't go out and or can't travel or whatever. But I think it's yeah, being in the space is something um, substantial. So talking about space, I think what we learned also during the pandemic and just after the pandemic and in this wave where we could receive the public that we need to provide in our museums, whether it be blockbuster shows or whatever, more comfort for people. Because people are starting to get used to see shows in a different way. I mean, they have to wait longer in line, but they can also look at the things much calmer and much better. These, to create this comfort is going to be a challenge and I do not want to hear any longer of some raiders who are trying to invent for us first class tickets, business class tickets, premium tickets and economy tickets in order to visit museums. We just have to learn to design spaces, exhibitions, in a different way yeah. and the comfort is also coming along with something I now start to feel especially in Paris in museums which is a real um, a real desire for in French you call it le flow le long durée durational experiences I mean the way people spend at the crystal or the way people now spend time at the Centre Pompidou at Tate Modern it, it, for me it was already a fact is that people want to spend more time. And this durational effect is not just in exhibitions, it's in sport manifestations, it's in theater, it's even in film. So we have to, take, we have to think about it, that as well. And the long durée, le flow, this duration is extremely important together with comfort. 
mm. which is going to be a major challenge for programming our museums, for designing exhibitions, and even for the architecture but of upcoming Don't you think museums. it's a liberation? It's rather as um, Suzanne has been doing in extending those runs. It's, what, it's how we've managed the pandemic period at Tate. And my colleagues have done extraordinary work to space exhibitions out more. They look more beautiful like that. Mm -hmm. And the response from people about, uh, as they've started to return to the social world has been deeply emotional. And to me, that is what we should be making our exhibitions and displaying our collection for, to give people time to have a deeper engagement. And That's so immersive. I'm looking at yeah. the experience that people are having now, and rather than measuring it by saying, oh, that's 50% less people than we had before COVID, I'm saying we have 75% higher engagement and enjoyment of what we're doing. People, people don't want to be crowded into a Paul Arego exhibition. They actually want to stand in front of the paintings and really take them in. That's called immersive, mm -hmm. you know. Immersive doesn't mean to blow up a Van Gogh painting <laughs> uh, to 14 by 12 meters. I mean, what Maria is talking about, that's a true immersive exhibition. That's augmented reality. <laughs> but but it's, it's, I, I agree about the experience and it sounds wonderful, but that sounds like even fewer people in museums. And of course, one of the big topics that Museums have been talking about this for 40 years, but I think Black Lives Matter, the death of George Floyd, that sort of lit a touch paper into this whole issue of racial equality. We all know that. It's been talked about for a lot longer. Museum visitors still largely do come from a very small, or relatively small group of society. And I think one of the big questions now, isn't it, is who are museums for? How are you going to get a wider public in? You made a very passionate... Uh, you know, uh, argument for public subsidy, Chris, but that means everybody pays and not everybody's visiting. So how are we going to really change museum visitorships and not just talk about it? The hard facts are sadly enough, the hard facts are sadly enough that we create much more and much better infrastructure, but it's the same 30% who enjoying it, at least in France. So we do have to do something about it. Thanks to, and I hate to say the word thanks to, thanks to the pandemic. I mean, the bigger museums, including Versailles and the Louvre, start to take care finally again for local communities because the tourists who spent maybe a maximum of 40 minutes in the Louvre and 40 minutes at the boutique of the Louvre, they do not come anymore and they are not going to come for the next one to two years. So we have to rethink the programming in terms of our local communities. And I can only say that the new directors of the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay and, and the Centre Pompidou, they are really thinking in that way. Even, even saying the Centre Pompidou has to decentralize. And I'm not talking about creating a satellite again uh, in a faraway country like China or Belgium, but to do something in, uh, the, Grand, in the Grand Paris. That's, uh, uh, I think, a very, very important form of decentralization. Forget about China. I mean, it's impossible anyway to go there right now. So the only thing why we need China is because China is paying us, right? Tom, I'd be very interested to hear, yeah, because you're building a museum kind of from the ground up, so. Totally. And of course, it's in a context of South Africa where, you know, kind of the inequities of the past all live with us on the daily. Um, and so we're also navigating on kind of our immediate audiences very much kind of, you know, issues of race and access and, um, you know, and access is a big issue in a place like Cape Town, where kind of, you know, unequal development over the last 50, 60 years, 100 years, 200 years, has just kind of like created these deep kind of entrenched kind of, um, kind of schisms in society. So, and how do we address that as a museum? Um, I think museums cannot necessarily change societal issues at a core level but we have a responsibility in terms of the activation of those debates and conversations. And how we do that is from within. Um, we don't have the same issues, I think, necessarily than kind of fellow panelists here or other museums in the US and, and Europe, where there's definitely a kind of issue of representation within kind of like staffing, yeah. kind of board members and all of that. So I think until that kind of is addressed also um, in a real way, um, significant work 
has been done at the Zeitz Mocha in the last two and a half years to also think about governance and kind of representation and the transformation of, of kind of a board of trustees and what that means. And, um, and so that work is on the go. Um, but I just want to come back a little bit also. Yep, sorry, I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. I mean, for, I have been working on these issues for the whole of my museum mm. career, and me and everybody else has not made enough impact. I feel, I feel like and we that, were discussing uh, this at the Museums Association in completely. the 90s. Um, and, um, and so that, that accepting that is, for me, the first step towards significant change. And last year, made it absolutely clear why all of us, this is a, an issue for all of us, nobody has left aside from this debate. And to me, there are always three things that um, we have to think about as a museum, which is who, who works for us, who governs us. So those people, who are they, has to be looked, and there has to be significant work to change who is making up the museum workforce. And, that, and that's and, difficult uh, because you can't just get rid of people. I mean, but um, <laughs> we recruit all the. It is not as difficult. It's possible to do. It is not as difficult as we have um, allowed it to be. And change has to happen. And change has to happen in the program and the works that we collect. And then, and then change. And then only then will change happen in people who come. And you can do different things. So Francis Morris and the team at Tate Modern this summer in response to, if you like, the needs of London, but also the needs of the museum to bring local people in, um, offered um, Please Draw Freely, um, Gutai-inspired experience for families to use the Turbine Hall, which is a covered street, really, um, to use it as um, the largest drawing space that anyone could imagine. Now those kind of actions really do start to change who comes in because it addresses Chris's point about comfort, about who starts to feel comfortable about being able to come in and enjoy the things that are free. And that's the really important thing. That's, that's what's amazing in the book uh, which just came out, The Future of Museums, that not just the people invited here at art talks or conferences mm -hmm. are talking about this idea, but also, I mean, directors of mainstream museums, suddenly they are talking about these changes. And that's heartfelt, that's great, that we really want to take these things suddenly serious. Mm -hmm. And if you read through the interviews, they are keeping saying, all these different museum directors, exactly the same things. And that, you know, we are not longer alone. Uh, Utopia is, is, is there. We, can, we just have to, you know, reach out to it right now. See, Chris, it can't be utopic, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> S S Suzanne, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts. <laughs> you know, I, maybe I approach it from a different angle because I think, and I think it's really not comparable. I'm a really small museum. So I have uh, a different task and different audience, and um, uh, so it's, Difficult to compare us, I think. And also, yeah, but I think for for me it's important. I think it's easy to reflect, you know, certain issue like in exhibitions, but really to change the whole structure of your own museum. Like we had a show three years ago on racism and anti-Semitism in Germany, 2018, and since then we are working, you know, on our structure. We did. Uh, like courses with the whole team was on a Frank Centrum in Frankfurt and now we had like different teams who were like working with us on making the museum more accessible in the space and on the website and it's a whole on the homepage whole thing which is going on and I think it's the task is for me which is really difficult how to bring people who never have access to a museum to a museum. And um, this is something which we start now programs where we're really working with children who are really guided from where they are to the museum because you know all our children program it's only for the for the children which our parents are really interested in art and I think that's wonderful and uh, that's also one of our tasks. But so many children um, never even heard what a museum is and what uh, what a space it is and I think it's a important space of freedom of 
you know, when we did the show museums two years ago, it was, I felt surrounded by a new uprising fascism all over Europe, but also in the States, that I thought, okay, what is the task of a museum? And one of the main answers is a museum is always the place of thinking differently. And this is why I think we all love art. And this is a space we also have to provide and also to defend. And um, yeah, I think it's a lot of things uh, to think on different levels. Um, but I think it's a task to bring really a different audience to open up the opportunity of being with art and um, not only for people who are anyway have the education and find their ways. Mm -hmm. We're getting near the end, so we're very happy to take questions. I'm sure there are people in the audience who would like to ask something. If you would like to ask a question, just stick your hand up. While you're thinking, I'm just going to ask Maria a bit about the, the, the staffing issue, um, because I think we were talking a bit about the fact that um, you're thinking about different ways of recruiting, different ways of training people. I mean, it's a huge problem in the museum world that people have to have such high levels of qualifications salaries are low, this is excluding a lot of different people. But we don't necessarily have to well, that's have the question, high levels isn't it? of qualifications. <laughs> so um, again, one of the things that we're doing as we emerge from the, from the pandemic um, at Tate, across all the Tates is to establish an apprenticeship scheme that brings um, younger, not very young, but 18 to 25 year olds into the organisation who don't have um, the standard academic qualifications, but will have all the skills and talents that we need for the organisation. <coughs> and across further education in the UK, there were all the support structures so that um, those young adults would um, gain the knowledge and the kind of um, um, on-site expertise really rapidly. So we widen the talent pool that comes into the um, the institution then and we're not then only drawing on people whose parents are wealthy enough to be able to fund mm -hmm. them through education and um, we won't lose us but we need a whole spectrum of people coming into museums otherwise we will never be mm. creatively diverse organizations yeah yeah Chris what about in the, the French museums are people taking steps to to widen the staff to change the yeah I mean, uh, you know, I have to watch out what I'm saying because my seven syndicates are listening uh, real time <laughs> to this. Um, no, th in order to be serious, I think that the training of educators, museum educators, young curators is absolutely crucial right now. And I can see m different countries, often Anglo-Saxon countries, where, uh, you know, education is costing, is costing so much that we cannot get these kids in who are eager to learn, who want to become museum educators or art educators or even young educators. So it's before we do this, we have to think about how can we make this more democratic. So we have to invent new kinds of art schools, art theory schools, art curatorial schools. And the, 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 the true basis of changing our museums is to get these young kids in. And I'm saying why. The fact that our museums are changing is very much thanks to a younger generation of directors who came from Kunsthalles, who came from biennials, who had experience abroad in the Middle East, in Africa, Latin America, coming from these countries, who were used to think about participatory experiences. Now these people are coming, becoming to be senior curators, chief curators, and even museum directors. And that's absolutely something which is fantastic because that's the reason also why museums are suddenly changing overnight yeah. Yeah. thanks to with together with the pandemic <laughs> and i can only only thank these people that they are willing to take these jobs so but it starts with education mm. I, just I, th I, think, I think we had a question at the back and then a gentleman here Oh, sorry. Just very, very quickly to say that um, Zeitzmoker has launched a fellowship program, a Pan-African fellowship program that kicks off in February next year. We have the first five fellows expected in, in a couple of months. And that's also kind of uh, in collaboration with the University of Western Cape. So part practical experience at the museum and also um, they will leave with a postgraduate degree through the uh, accredited degree. And so those kind of programs are we see as essential at the moment. And I also just want to give a shout out 
to a visionary director like Thelma Golden, for example, mm -hmm. at the Studio Museum, who has done so much work um, in this regard. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, I think at the back, I c I've got my glasses on, so I can't see too well. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, there was a few points that were raised by the different panelists, but this idea of sustainability, um, and then this ever-growing desire for bigger audiences, bigger cultural spaces, and Maria just mentioned that, you know, people, or, you know, the number of visitors will affect how, you know, carbon footprint and so on. And so borrowing from economic thinking at the moment about this idea of degrowth, which, um, you know, is becoming popularized, not the idea that we will not grow, but that qualitative growth is better than simply infinite growth. And I want to know how you would respond to that in the context of museums, which as we see around the world are increasingly larger and larger in size. And also the demand, sorry, demand of governments to have cultural institutions to have millions of visitors a year and things like that, mm. for tourism and things, yeah. I am happy to be the director of Tate um, that can say, I think we're big enough now. It's great, <laughs> but it doesn't need to be any bigger. Um, and what I want to say, we actually know the qualitative measures already that we could use, that we could be putting on our websites, that we could be championing with government. It is things like how we educate young people, how we open up routes into our institutions, or just the emotional register of the art encounter for an everyday visitor on a Sunday. You know, it, that's entirely measurable. One of the great conversations in the UK that has really um, been strengthened by the pandemic is a society-wide conversation about well-being and what aids it. And definitely, coming to museums and being in a not too crowded space alongside people that you don't know is demonstrably beneficial to people's well-being and sense of connection to society. And that's the kind of um, goal I think we should be working for because it allows the artists and the art to do the work that it does. The concept of degrowth is part of our negotiations with the state oh, that's because uh, the French state is fully aware that putting more money into infrastructure is not saying that we can reach more people because again a recent report said it's the same 30 percent and if we reach more it's through these digital uh, means but doesn't mean that these digital means are creating more museum visitors mm -hmm. I mean, we believe that looking at the map, the mat and the website of the map that more visitors would come in, but it's, it's not growing there. So this degrowth issue is much part of our discussion with the state also because we see how many people flock for maybe different reasons to private museums like the Bourse de la Commerce or uh, to the Fondation Louis Vuitton. Yeah. So, you know, we have to, we have to make sure that, that we keep saying we are different. We are not married. We are not even divorced because we were never married. Okay? So we are doing and we have to do things differently. Did you want to say, no, no, say something? Suzanne? Okay. I think there was a question over here. Yeah. Hello. It's, it's, it's this gentleman at the front. Yeah. Thank you. Some museums uh, like to open branches in distant countries, like the Guggenheim started it, and the French Cotton, the Pompidou's got a branch in Shanghai, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, etc., etc. But on the other hand, young kids, like from 12 onwards, they don't watch TV, they communicate between each other with their little telephones and iPhones and so on. What do the museums do to actually catch their attention? It's a big competition for the attention of the younger generation. And I haven't noticed many special techniques of catching exactly those people in the age groups of, let's say, 12 to 18. OK, so that's a question about young audiences. I mean, we found. Um in the last, since the museum reopened um, after the first lockdown pandemic, that our audiences has been very young um, and getting kind of almost younger than they were before. Um, we felt that there's a, a kind of an interest to come to the museum. It's also a quieter space. Um, 
The museum is accessible and free of charge for anybody under 18 years old, 18s and, and younger. And part of our work at curatorial in our curatorial department is the Center for Art Education that has been actively working exactly to connect with, with, with younger audiences in very active ways. Um, I think this kind of like, I, I don't think we're competing necessarily with kind of like potential distractions. I think um, it's, a, it's a way of harnessing that. Um, but yeah, I think it's also, the, the audience is important for us. Mm. Does anyone else want to say about young audience? I mean, I would just make two observations. One is that um, because of the length of time during the pandemic, the schools were closed. Um, young people have had, I think, almost the worst of um, the pandemic. And we have seen lots of um, young people very keen to come back to the galleries and be engaged in activities because they have been so isolated and lonely. And so we offer social spaces that are wanted. And then there's a slightly more cliched answer that if you, if you go to the, the um, media that the young people are using, they are super interested. So um, Tate doesn't do its own TikTok but there are a group of young people who are, have developed TikTok for and with us, and that's where they want to go because they are the creatives in that space. Anyone else like to say anything about young audiences? Suzanne, no? I think in general we have a quite young audience, an uh, average between 20 and 35, but it's, I think this is, for me it always comes out of the art of self, and I think the approaches can be on different ways, I think it's a good example to do it with TikTok or some, but in the end I think uh, I, I observe also in a young audience that they're also quite, as you said, reluctant to always be in digital and it's also nice like to be in the space and to draw. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's still something, you know, we have so many media changes in the last centuries that I always think that it doesn't mean if there's a new media that all the other media disappears, and I think we should be also a bit stubborn and st stay in certain parts as we are, and also to provide the spaces where just children lying on the floor and draw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think unless there's... Oh, there are more questions. Okay, uh, lady there, and then this gentleman here. Hello. As the world changes, you start to see people from the commerce industry dedicating a certain percentage of their walls and their stores and their shelf space to diversity. Do you foresee the museums of the future dedicating any percentage of their walls in the museum or their space to reflect the diversity of the cities that the museums are in? Absolutely. I um, think this is something which is so easy to have an exhibition, but we are working, for example, to change our structure, but it's whether you do it totally radical and just do it, but I think this is something we, yeah. It's, I think that's the most difficult, but it's the most crucial thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, absolutely, it, it's a stated aim at Tate to work towards representation that reflects the towns and cities that we're in, which are all quite different. London is one situation, St. Ives, Liverpool, very different. And um, in, 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 in areas around um, gender representation, because there's been 25 years of dedicated work around that. We are getting there. We have much further to go around um, proper representation across race, ethnicity, sexuality, but we are um, working toward it very um, deliberately and purposefully. You, you started, as I say, from the ground up. So do you, you, don't, do you have this problem, Storm, or is your collection already? Yes and no. I mean, we, we an, a museum dedicated to to, you know, the art, contemporary art from Africa and its diaspora. So I think, you know, kind of our ambit is quite specific. At one point, it was focused almost exclusively on the 21st century, but we've also broadened that out now. Not to say that, like, issues of, of representation and diversity is not something that we're not concerned with, um, but, you know, kind of, our, we, our exhibitions are by African artists and um, African diasporic artists, so I think that that's just very clear, you know. Um, um, in terms of museum visitors, I think there is work that we mm -hmm. need to do and do. So, um, if that's that's also you know kind of maybe part of the question here. Um, but yeah, I think the uh, yeah it's it's a much more clearer picture for us. I think. Yeah. I think there was another question. Yeah. 
Hello, how are you? Uh, my name is Jordan. I'm the COO of Walters Cube. It's a technology company inspired by physical space, relational identity, and reconstructive storytelling. Uh, we've created digital twins of exhibition spaces for curators, institutions, artists, exhibition designers, providing the ability for public discourse between artists and enthusiasts visiting remotely. Uh, one of the challenges of access is providing democratic public experiences. So we created onlineviewingroom.com. Could I just ask and what your question <laughs> is? Yes, I'm getting, I'm getting to it. Here, here it is. We so like see the, the internet as the most egalitarian oh access point to experience art it's for the like public. The, oh. And so one so way this is being done in New York City is providing oh. free days for the public. That's a move. Sorry. And so what ideas are being cultivated I'm to provide immersive participatory programming and you have you designated the gamification of arts education okay now that's a kind of massive storm, question storm storm as an answer to uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> i think you kind of heard me mic um but thank you i, I don't think it needs to respond to that i don't know yeah, i think <laughs> I, th I, th I that was the response right that was a response right yeah. yes okay thank you it's the question here it was a long intro what are you doing for the gamification of arts education? We talked about TikTok. We talked about how are we reaching people beneath the age of 20. And the internet is the way that this discourse is, is being uh, carried out. Well, well, all these museums have very extensive digital offerings. I think it would be fair to say across a multitude of platforms. Yes, yeah, we do. And, um, uh, but I think my short response would also be that the pandemic has demonstrated to us in the UK the extent of digital poverty across communities and that access to the internet is not democratic um, it really unevenly distributed um, um, across our country. And so there are challenges and issues. And, Many museums have just taken laptops into schools so that children can still access things. So there's a place, of course, for um, us playing with all the new technologies that, um, that we have um, uh, to utilise. Mm -hmm. And also, I do think, I think people need to come to museums. Taking into account digital sobriety, which is something you have to think about as well, I think, in your publicity, um, it's, we are taking uh, escape games and video gaming extremely serious, serious, even for the way we will design exhibitions in the future. We can learn from these tools, okay? And we take it incredibly serious. And we are not the only ones, because some artists were good artists, they are taking it also serious, not just as a metaverse, but also as a tool. So, yes, yes, we are, and uh, I think there are very good escape game developers or programmers or designers. There are very good ones, and there are also very bad ones. And, and we are, do want to work with the good ones, and we learn a lot from them. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, if there's no more questions, I'd like to say an enormous thank you to our panel. It was a very big subject. I'm grateful for your... <laughs> attempting to ask such a big subject in this short time. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.